Tonight's speaker is a man who's no stranger to fascinating Monmouth County history. He's written many, many articles, is an excellent researcher, and has uncovered some great details through that original research. So he's really adding to the historical record, which we appreciate so much. You can check out his website, mammothtimeline.org, to learn more about what John's doing. But tonight, you'll get a taste of that research with his presentation, Four Amazing Geniuses from Little Silver. So without further ado, please welcome John Barrows. All right, let's go. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Dana. And um, thanks again to MCHA for continuing um, to uh, provide so much support to uh, historians and researchers. Um, it, re it really is a great blessing that this community has to have so many resources and so many dedicated people like uh, Dana and everybody at MCHA. Um, my reason for choosing this topic this year is that Little Silver is celebrating its centennial. Uh, the Little Silver is where I've lived for almost 30 years and we've loved every minute of it and it's uh, helped us uh, learn a lot about uh, the region and the state um, and um, it's, it's where I started uh, my historical interest and expanding from there to sort of every corner of the county. Uh, Little Silver was first settled in 1667, but it wasn't incorporated until 1923 from parts of Shrewsbury Township. And we're having a big celebration. Uh, this is a celebration of classic small town Americana. Uh, Little, Sil Little Silver's all of two square miles. Parade, music, bands, face painting, stuff for kids to do. So if you have nothing better to do on the 24th, come help us celebrate our centennial. For those of you who don't know where Little Silver is, it's that red outlined boot shaped thing on the right, and it borders Red Bank and Fairhaven, as well as Rumson and Shrewsbury, Oceanport and Fort Monmouth. As for me, <clears throat> four years ago, I started a project to bring together all of the best stories of Monmouth County history onto a website, and it's called monmouthtimeline.org. And every day we specialize on putting out what happened on this day in Monmouth County history, and we also have a lot of featured stories that are by some of the greatest storytellers and historians in our region, uh, everyone from Rick Gefkin and Joe Bilby to uh, um, Randall Gabrielon and Melissa Ziobro and others. And uh, every is a robust search tool. So this is meant to be uh, something that's convenient for students and researchers, uh, but also of interest to anyone who's just uh, has fun with history. We have over 220 stories across multiple categories, everything from crime, ships and shipwrecks, Revolutionary War, women's history, black history. So check it out. We also have uh, started something called a art initiative out of the recognition that um, a lot of our oldest stories have no good art. And so we have commissioned artists to bring to life some of our important stories, such what you see here, which is the militia captain Joshua Huddy when he was captured by Colonel Ty and the Black Brigade. This is the story of Wreckers, the land pirates of Monmouth County. Uh, this was in Barnegat in the 1830s. The time that Booker T. Washington came to Red Bank to meet with T. Thomas Fortune. It was a very high profile meeting, made front page news. Uh, and this is the life and times of Samuel Mingo Jack Johnson, who was uh, lynched in Eatontown. And uh, for which, uh, for all of these stories, there was no art that existed before. We have four new works of art coming on stream in the next few weeks. And so if you uh, want to stay on top of that, you can visit our social media pages on facebook.com and um, we will be unveiling a lot of great new stuff in the weeks ahead. Now, this is about four geniuses and our first genius is Dr. Walter Van Fleet, probably the greatest plant breeder America's yet known. That was written after his death. And that's a pretty tall statement, isn't it? Um, that Walter Van Fleet, that's him on the left. Uh, he was born June 18, 1857 in Rockland County in New York State. And he began his career as a young man writing articles for ornithology magazines. He actually traveled the world uh, to, to see uh, rare birds uh, that he wrote about um, for magazines. And this is before he even graduated college. After he graduated college, he attained a medical degree and he practiced medicine as a physician for about 10 years. During this whole time between the birds and the medicine, his real passion was roses and, and horticulture. And so eventually he gave up the, the medicine practice to focus on his true passion. Now, what is horticulture? It's not gonna get into all of this. Point is it's as old as, as time itself. Uh, horticulture has always been closely tied with agriculture, meaning farmers were the ones who were originally most likely to experiment with new ways to get crops to, to 
grow earlier in the season, later in the season, to be more resistant to drought or blight or insects or what have you. Um, and so all of the great ancient, ancient civilizations um, practiced horticulture, but they didn't start to devolve into separate uh, fields of science until the colonial era. Now, in the Americas, here's one I bet most people didn't know. Did you know honeybees are not native to North America? So a lot of the horticulture really did believe in the North America did begin with the colonial era, uh, as opposed to um, uh, the, the uh, civilizations. That, now, obviously, native civilizations were doing things with corn and a lot of their crops, too. So basically, every civilization has tried to control nature in that regard. But the honeybees were obviously are such a key thing for our. And then uh, <clears throat> for thousands of years, uh, it was uh, uh, evolving as, uh, as a science, and of course, horticulture is defined as the science of uh, growing fruits, vegetables, and plants. Um, and over the years, there were a whole, you know, there's, read these for yourself, that there are a lot of firsts that uh, over the years, the colonies granted various, saw various kinds of uh, horticulture businesses start up of one sort or another. Now, here in Monmouth County, it really all began with the Hans family. This is one of the oldest families in Monmouth County. And Asher Hans was able to purchase a 500 acre tract, a river to river tract of land. And just ponder that for a second, a, a tract of land that went from the Navasink River all the way to the Shrewsbury River. And he did, he, he used that for farming, but he eventually uh, got into uh, uh, horticulture, uh, branched out, if you will. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but eventually he found that horticulture was too much work and uh, so he decided to sell the horticulture business to an enterprising young man working for him named John Thompson Lovett. There's John Thompson Lovett. He is, was, is and was a larger-than-life figure in Little Silver. He was born in Pennsylvania and worked for Asher Hans as a young man. And after striking out uh, on his own, running Hans's agriculture business, now called Lovett's Nurseries, he slowly began investing in real estate and are all around Monmouth County. And he set up his headquarters and his earliest uh, greenhouses uh, in Little Silver along Church Street, right across from the church and the church cemetery. And Lovett was a pioneer in the use of mail order. And he actually had a printing uh, uh, press uh, built right into his headquarters and so that he could produce these kinds of gorgeous color catalogs uh, on his own. Uh, he even became postmaster at one time because that was how important it was that mail uh, was uh, handled efficiently and, and expertly. And uh, these catalogs that he sold had hundreds and hundreds of things in them. They had all kinds of fruit, all kinds of flowers, uh, at trees, shrubs, decorative flowers, uh, you name it. It, it. They were really comprehensive. Um, uh, and in his heyday, Lovett's business was selling to customers in every state in the union, all 38. Um, and a thrive, it was a thriving John Thompson Lovett that attracted Walter Van Fleet to Little Silver in 1894. Van Fleet had become tired of traveling and he wanted to settle down for good and focus on his hybrid breeding. <clears throat> Van Fleet became managing editor of a magazine called Orchard and Garden that was also published by Lovett. And then Van Fleet purchased six acres adjoining Lovett's nursery where he built his greenhouse and his first home, a place known as Rural Grounds, about which we know very, very little. So Van Fleet was not actually an employee of Lovett's. He was essentially a freelancer. Um, in the 10 years he was at Little Silver during the prime of his career, he developed more than 50 breeds of flora that are registered with the authorities, recognized as unique, distinct breeds. Uh, but many of these were developed for other nursery operators in addition to Lovett. And um, what's amazing is that his work was so incredibly strong and powerful that some of the... Uh, Roses in particular, and other uh, plants that Walter Van Fleet essentially invented, are still commercially cultivated to this very day and are available for sale. But all of those pictures you're looking at right now, those are from websites where you can buy those products right now. So those were called the Lovett Sisters Climbing Roses. And Van Fleet bred each one of those and named them after each of John Thompson Lovett's three daughters, the Alita Lovett Rose, the Best Lovett Rose and the Mary Lovett Rose. And if you're into growing uh, flowers and roses, you might want to consider growing local um, because these flowers have a story. And in particular, each of Lovett's daughters lived in Little Silver and they had interesting lives of their own. So uh, uh, in, a, in addition, there's uh, a certain, uh, there's other trees that, that Van Fleet developed that are still for sale, including the King, the Norway King Crimson Maple. Um, 
1935, oh, just back, behave, behave. In 1935, Mafia kingpin Vito Genovese bought this house, then known as the Dangler Mansion, to serve as his weekend estate. Vito hired Monmouth County locals to make significant improvements in the house and the property, including building cascading waterfall pools, a sunken garden, a cupola, a working model of Mount Vesuvius, and a three-hole golf course. A local landscape architect was hired, and John Thompson Lovett provided all of the floor used to decorate the new villa. So in all probability, a lot of those plants that were developed by Van Fleet were part of what was used to decorate Vito de Genovese's mansion. Now, the mansion burned down in 1937 under suspicious, suspicious circumstances after Vito had fled the U.S. to Italy to avoid murder charges. The property changed hands several times and is now known as Deep Cut Park, and it's located on Red Hill Road in Middletown. And there, the grounds, the buildings are gone, but the grounds have been preserved, including the cascading pools, which is absolutely gorgeous, and the sunken garden. Now, the sunken garden was not a rose garden in Vito's day, but it is now. I don't know if you feel the way I, but I look at that, it sure seems to me that there would be room in there somewhere for a, a rose that was grown by, invented by Walter Van Fleet and grown by uh, J.T. Lovett and was a part of the original flora of this property. Um, but I can't get anyone at the Parks Department to care. Oh, well, so it goes. Anyway, thanks to Van Fleet's ability to create compelling new breeds, and if you get these catalogs in the mail today from these plant growers, you know that they're breathless about what's new. It's like, you can't, we don't, those were last year's lilies. Those were last year's flowers. You want this year's flowers. Well, it was the same thing in the turn of the century. You had to keep coming up with new things. That's what was Walter Van Fleet's genius. It wasn't as easy as he made it look. But because he was so great at it, he was able to do things like he invented something called the early Jersey giant strawberry and the late Jersey giant strawberry. And these enabled farmers to extend the seasonality of this cash crop. It was immensely important work he was doing. Um, and uh, it, it allowed that, uh, 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 love it to expand throughout Monmouth County. At one point, he had something like 30 different pieces of property all around Monmouth County from Asbury Park to Colts Neck and everywhere in between. Uh, and um, especially along Ridge Road in Fairhaven and Rumson. And travelers back in the day when Van Fleet was there would remark if they were traveling, if they, arrived, if they came to our region in springtime, that the trip from Red Bank to Seabright was the most spectacular part of their visit. As nice as the beach and the ocean were, they were driving down Ridge Road when it was ablaze in fragrant blossoms on both sides where it was hard to keep their eyes on the road. Uh, so it was, it had, it had to have been amazing at the time. But all the little uh, uh, parcels of land here that are in yellow uh, were among the last of the Lovett properties. Um, it eventually became a family business. His sons took over. Uh, as real estate became far more valuable for development, uh, both residential and commercial, um, it became, you know, mess, you know, and pretty much everybody was getting out of the nursery and, and farming business in that part of the state. And sure enough, the Lovett family decided to close down the little silver operations and move the headquarters to the former grounds of the North American phalanx along the swimming river in Colts Neck. Um, but eventually, in the 60s, they, they shut the whole thing down and sold off all the land for, I'm going to guess, a fairly pretty penny. But this gives you an idea. And by the way, if you're, if you're ever driving down Ridge Road uh, uh, in Fairhaven, all of those parks and, and uh, baseball parks and ball fields and sports a complex along those, those were all former Lovett nurseries. So Van, Dr. Van Fleet only spent 10 years in Little Silver. He would have stayed there forever, I think. But he got offered the job of a lifetime. He was appointed in 1909 as superintendent of the U.S. Department of Agriculture Introduction Gardens at Chico, California, which is today known as the Chico Seed Orchard. So this was a place where he continued his same work, except instead of doing it on a freelance basis for New Jersey nurseries, he was doing it on behalf of the entire American agriculture community. Same exact work, trying to come up with breeds that were more resistant to, to problems, trying to come up with breeds that extended the seasonality, trying to come up with bigger, better, you know, you know uh, and he was uh, he was uh, obviously great at it. So he was the leading American uh, hybridizer um, for decades. Um, and uh, 
Uh, he held this position pretty much for the rest of his career. He died in Florida in 1922, and he is not commemorated anywhere in New Jersey that I'm aware of. Our next genius, well, that looks like it should hurt the eyes, but it's just a picture, I promise. Russell Shoemaker O, author of the Silicon Solar Cell. I'm not going to read all this to you. The point of all this is that for decades, scientists understood that the rays of the sun contain energy, which could be captured, stored, and potentially transmitted or distributed. The problem was nobody could figure out how to do it efficiently. So all of the early tech advancements, it always required more external energy to make the process work than was captured in the process. So it was that was so it it, it it stayed stuck in that way for almost 50 years at one point until a radio engineer came along named Russell Ohl. So Russell Ohl was born January 30th, 1898, in uh, Pennsylvania near Allentown, and he studied radio engineering as a senior in college in a class that was offered by the U.S. Army Signal Corps out of Fort Monmouth. And after graduating, Old joined the Army and was assigned to Fort Monmouth, where he continued experimenting with silicon-based radio conductors. After World War I ended, Old was discharged, began working for the Electric Storage Battery Company of Philadelphia, where he was assigned to the development of a 320-volt battery to operate the Signal Core radio telephone transmitter on airplanes. And for you radio geeks, that's SCR-68. After nine months there, he left because he thought the working environment was unsafe, and he hired on with the Westinghouse Lamp Company in Bloomfield, New Jersey, where he had the opportunity to work with leading figures in radio science, such as Edwin Armstrong. 1921, he married his high school girlfriend, Ruth, and then took a job teaching physics at the University of Colorado, where he continued his experiments with silicon conductors. 1922, the Olds moved to the Bronx, where they lived on Andrews Avenue for five years, while Russell worked in the research department for AT&T at 195 Broadway. 1927, Russell Lowell was transferred to AT&T's Bell Labs facility in Cliffwood near Matawan. The Olds moved into a house on Woodbine Avenue near Cross Street in what is now called the Foxwood Park neighborhood of Little Silver. Over the years, the Olds made a number of real estate transactions involving lots in their immediate neighborhood, all transactions carrying a sale price of $1. Make of that what you will. Here's his breakthrough, patented 1946. Light sensitive electric light. There it is, Russell Lowell, Little Silver, New Jersey. What was going on was that he and his, and his colleagues were working on radio conductivity using silicon. What they realized was that sometimes when they were using a highly purified piece of silicon, it would have an inner, a, a natural flaw in it, sort of like an inside, inner crack kind of thing. And that there would be more electrons on one side of the flaw than the other. And that when light struck the silicon, energy jumped across the flaw. And these guys were smart enough to realize that what they were witnessing was energy being from the rays of the sun being captured, stored, and transmitted. And so they used a silicon working on, on the backs of all of the research of the scientists who had come before them, but had not used silicon to come up with this light sensitive device, which was 1% effective. Okay, but no one had ever come up with a, a positive, efficient, a way of capturing energy from the sun. So that's why this was such a big deal. Um, that breakthrough actually also led Ohl, um, is largely credited with uh, the development of the, the, the diode, including the um, light emitting diode, the LED. Um, so he, uh, he's both, both potentially one of the founding fathers of solar energy and light emitting diodes, um, among other things. Uh, he did not, he stayed focused on radio. He didn't focus on solar energy, um, as, as you might think, um, but others at Bell Labs did. And, and it, it took, so it, that, was, that patent was 1946. So it took nine years to start from 1% efficiency to get to the first uh, solar panels. Um, but solar panels, as you know, are a basis um, to this day uh, of solar energy around the world. After his breakthrough, um, Russell Lowell became a bit of a celebrity, uh, and apparently people were just coming by the dozens by his lab every day 
find out what he was working on next, what kind of great mysteries of the earth he was solving. And it was a lot of pressure, apparently, where, you know, he, he, he wasn't allowed to just, you know, inch his uh, discoveries along, um, but he was expected to turn his attention and break some incredible new ground um, uh, pretty much with every passing uh, day. And so, at any rate, um, Russell Lowell's legacy, he eventually was granted 82 U.S. patents, uh, which were extended into other countries, into 50 other kinds, uh, it, 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 again, the LED, and as you can imagine. Now, there's a ton of money in, in solar energy, but Russell Lowell didn't make any money from his patents or inventions. No one did in those days. There were people who were earning patents at 3M, Kodak, RCA, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, IBM and, and all of those, some of these uh, great geniuses at all these companies were just paid salaries and uh, generally they uh, did not change jobs very often. Um, so it's a, it really was a different time in that regard. Um, and in the later years, um, after uh, the um, death of his friend and colleague, who is our next genius, um, the Oles moved to Fairhaven for a little while, then after retirement, uh, they moved to California to be closer to where their kids were living. Um, uh, the old family was uh, both uh, Russell and his wife were very active in the local community um, and uh, leaders. Um, uh, his his son Russell L. Ohl served as a pilot in World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam, which is impressive. I retired in 1958, died in 1987 at age 89. There's no monument or commemoration of Russell Lowell anywhere in Monmouth County. But when you drive around and you see solar panels on roofs, you're going to think of Russell Lowell. All right, our third genius, Carl Yansky, the father of radio astronomy. All right, how do I? All right. We're just gonna have to listen to some sound, I guess. Um, doesn't look like Monmouth County, does it? This was, place was built in 1980. And were immediately popular with Polly. You might recognize some of these uh, commercials and, and television shows and movies. Oh, now it looks like we're getting closer to New Jersey. Oh, maybe not. No, nope, that's not. I didn't see this one. I don't know. But you can just see how that they people love uh, using this in the background. This is probably the most famous of the movies that was done there. Contact, which was directed by Robert Zemeckis. And so, uh, <clears throat> see a sec. Yeah, this is what they look like in operations. You see, they're massive. They're bigger than a house. Uh, there's 27 of them on a Y-shaped uh, railroad tracks where they can be basically pointed in any direction at any time. So is, this is the Very Large Array Radio Telescope, which is as aptly named as I can think of anything. It's like the Titanic could have been called the Very Large Boat. Um, uh, but they, I, th I think they did better with Titanic. Anyway, you see NRAO on the left there and, and here. That stands for National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Now, this is a little more familiar. That should be familiar to everybody. That's the former Bell Labs, now known as Bell Works. And if you ever go there, and I highly recommend you do, if anything, just to see what was once called the world's largest mirror, um, designed by the great architect Eero Saarinen in his last major project. It, he did not live to see it finish. But if you go to this area down here, uh, that this part of Bell Works, you will be on Yansky Drive. There's a lot of 
prominent uh, astronomers and, and scientists that worked at Bell Labs. They don't all have roads named after them. You'll also see uh, this historical marker on this site. Carl Jansky first discovered radio waves coming from outer space, thus beginning the radio, the science of radio astronomy. That's not actually true. But it seems like he must have done something pretty important because there's a monument to him in that same place. That odd looking thing is the monument to Carl Yancey. So what did he do exactly? And, and who was he? So that's Carl Yansky as a young man. He was born in 1905 and what was then the territory of Oklahoma. His father, Cyril Yansky, was Dean of the College of Engineering at the University of Oklahoma and retired as a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Wisconsin. So uh, both he, uh, both the father was passed on to his sons, a love of science, including both radio and engineering and physics. Carl's older brother was Cyril Yansky Jr. And he had a keen interest in radio from an early age. He helped build some of the earliest radio transmitters in the country. And while a college student helped start the experimental radio station 9XM. Carl was actually an athlete from a very early age, despite the fact that he suffered from a debilitating kidney ailment. He played hockey, baseball, and tennis. And as an adult, when he lived in Little Silver, he actually won both Monmouth County and New Jersey State uh, championships in table tennis. Carl attended the University of Wisconsin, where he achieved a, achieved a bachelor's degree in physics in 1927. He applied for a job with Bell Labs, but was turned down because of his kidney ailment. But his brother Cyril, by now a well-established expert in radio science, had connections at Bell Labs, was able to provide, assur provide assurances that his brother was physically up to the rigors of professionally scientific research at the highest level. This is the Bell Labs facility in uh, Cliffwood um, near Matawan. And uh, it's where both Russell all worked as well as Carl Yansky. So Yansky jo joined Bell Labs in July of 1928. Owing to his, his health condition, um, Carl was sent to uh, this facility because it was believed it would be better suited for his health than, say, New York City. And uh, he was assigned to focus his research on identifying sources of radio noise or static that was interfering with transatlantic AT&T telephone calls. Now, in those days, they believed if you were doing research in radio, it, it was enhanced if you were working in a facility with this, a building with as little metal as possible. So that's why some of those leading researchers were working in this very Spartan-like research facility. Hardly a glamorous place, as you can tell. But you can see they, they went to a, a lot of trouble to minimize the amount of metal in it. Um, so uh, Russell Ohl was Carl Yansky's boss. And they carpooled to work together along with a couple of other people. And Yansky found these rides immensely useful. As the youngest person, he, he realized how much he could learn from some of these other people working on different projects. He was able to bounce ideas off of people. He was able to get feedback on what he was thinking. Um, so you know, the little, those little interactions made a big deal in his ability to have a, a, achieve a breakthrough. Um, and so, so you recall the historical marker that we looked at before said that he was the person who discovered that radio waves come from outer space. Not true, and we know that because Russell Ohl, after he retired, gave some lengthy interviews that were recorded in which he clarified that, in fact, there were others at Bell Labs that had already figured out um, that static on transatlantic call could be, could be caused by storms, bad weather, but they were still static noise at certain times of day for, for seemingly no reason. Um, that were coming from someplace that seemed extraterrestrial beyond planet Earth. But those people never researched it any further. Uh, and that's that's where it stayed until Carl Yansky came aboard. So this is uh, what Carl Yansky built. Now, this is a hand-built radio antenna uh, that rotates 360 degrees. It's built with on uh, some uh, wheels from a Ford Model T. Um, and some of his colleagues somewhat derisively called it Carl Yansky's merry-go-round. The idea was that Yansky was focusing the, this antenna on the direction that the radio signals were coming from, feeding data into the finest computers of 1930s, and, uh, and basically um, eventually coming to the conclusion that those radio signals were coming from a single spot in outer space, and that spot was the center of the Milky Way 
galaxy. There it is, the uh, finest computers of 1932. Um, when, he made, when he made this discovery, the higher-ups at Bell Labs didn't even know what it meant. They had no idea what, what, was, what was the big deal about that. Why was that important? How can we even believe it's true? Um, but what had happened was, whether any of them realized it, was that Yansky had just created overnight an entirely new field of science because before radio engineering was over here and astronomy was over there, now they come together in a brand new field of science, radio astronomy, which is still a major field of, of science by that name to this day. The, the higher ups at Bell Labs initially didn't want to give Yansky a ton of credit for his breakthrough. And they had total control over that. They had control over who got to apply for patents, who got to uh, deliver technical articles at, at, at conferences, um, who got to do pop, uh, interviews with popular press, who got to be in press releases announcing great breakthroughs. Um, and that was a process that could be plagued by petty politics and internecine warfares and jealousies. Um, so it was not always a really great place to work. And it seemed like Carl was going to get cheated out of his big moment, but his brother Cyril was able to use his influence to get one of the leading radio technical journals to cover Carl's breakthrough. And it made Carl somewhat of an overnight celebrity. So what you're looking at here is some of the national news coverage that showed how everyone's fascination with the fact that no matter where the, the Earth was uh, in the course of its uh, rotation and around the sun and its daily rotation, that those radio waves were always coming from the exact same spot. And uh, so, uh, with it, uh, with the, with the higher ups being a little angry at Yansky, once all that uh, died down, and, and at one point Yansky even uh, uh, demonstrated his work on a national radio interview where he was able to, to let the uh, con country know what the Milky Way sounded like. Now, again, you have to understand that up to this point, everything about astronomy was what could be seen with the eye through the most advanced optics in the world. Now, people, scientists are able to hear far, far further into your outer space than could be seen. That's why it was a really big deal. Now, others at uh, Bell Labs continued uh, Yansky's work, and um, eventually these famous men here, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, in front of the horn antenna, um, they, they won a share of the Nobel Prize for their work because they uh, built on what Yansky had discovered. And eventually, they were able to demonstrate that those radio waves from the Milky Way galaxy were, in fact, radio waves emanating from the origination of the universe, the Big Bang. It's one of the most important discoveries in radio astronomy history. And that horn antenna, some of you may know, that's still up there on top of Crawford Hill in Homedale. Now, you can't get near it. It's fenced off with, with uh, angry signs saying keep out and cameras everywhere. And uh, it's all private property. So it's up there somewhere, but you can't get near it in spite of how historically important it is. And uh, as some of you may know, it has become a source of, of some controversy because the people who own the real estate of that hill uh, are moving forward with plans to develop it. But nobody really knows who owns the antenna or what's going to happen to it. And even as of just this week, a couple of days ago, it's still completely up in the air, but the town has filed a lawsuit and everybody's mad at everybody. But the point is the community is rallying to make sure that that horn antenna gets saved, which I think is absolutely critically mandatory. It's far, far, far too important a relic of some of the great scientific achievements from our region. It has to be preserved. So here's the Yansky family. Uh, Front of their house on Silverton Ave and uh, Little Silver. Now, that was actually their second home in Little Silver. Uh, was, uh, again, if you don't want to believe me, it, this this was a very different time. Now, here's the neighborhood where Car where Russell Ohl lived, and that's where Carl Yansky lived. So Carl Yansky actually lived across town from Little Silver when he first moved there. But after carpooling with Russell Ohl and the others, became so enamored of his boss. But he actually picked up his family, sold his house, moved across town in Little Silver to move next door to his boss. I mean, I've never heard of that before. Now, don't pay attention to those numbers. Those are lot numbers. The house numbers, the mailing address house numbers, totally different. 
because people buying those lots bought doubles and triples and halves and combined all sorts of different things. So don't pay attention. Also, that Foxwood Park, that's named for Vincent Fox, who was the owner of the Police Gazette. And at one point in history, he bought up all of the land in that neighborhood. And so that's why it's now called Foxwood. But before that, it was called Lovett's Hill. After, you guessed it, John Thompson Lovett. Now, that's where Lovett's Nursery was in Little Silver originally, along uh, a church street across from the cemetery. And uh, uh, but there's an odd peculiarity, a geographical peculiarity to Little Silver that even a lot of residents, I find, don't know. And that's the little knob over there in the center left, which is claimed to be the highest point of elevation between Highlands and Delaware. And that's where, uh, so John Thompson Lovett first built his first residence there inside that red uh, 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 rectangle on Church Street. And that house is still there. And it's a very nice house, but he got, you know, at one point he, he owned more than half of the real estate in Little Silver, more than half of the people of Little Silver were working for him. He was an extremely wealthy man. So he built a house on top of this knob. And that's where he lived. Now he sold the, the property next to him and that's where Walter Van Fleet uh, put a house. So he, they, they had the same view, which we will see in a sec. In the meantime, there's where Russell Ohl and Carl Yansky live. And then in the meantime, when the uh, Lovett family eventually sold uh, the uh, Little Silver operations, the south and western part of that became the Acme, well, it's now the Acme supermarket. It's been 10 different kinds of supermarkets. It's a shopping center on one side. And the other side where that circle is, uh, is a housing development of townhomes. And our fourth genius, who's coming up in just a sec, lived there. So we don't even need the whole two square miles of Little Silver to show you where our or geniuses lived. But anyway, here is the house that John Thompson Lovett built um, along the way after uh, with other owners, it, it, it became known as Sky High. And you can't see this from the, the local streets around it. You can't see this from Prospect Street or from Branch Ave. It's because it's a very, it's a very shallow hill. You know, it's, a, it's not a very steep hill until this knob goes almost straight up at one point. And here is the view from Sky High. Uh, it's amazing to think that that's that that's a part of Little Silver that's closer to downtown Red Bank than the water, and you're almost looking down on the roof of the Channel Club in Monmouth Beach. That has to be one of the most spectacular views in all of Monmouth County, and most of the people I know in Little Silver don't even know it's up there. Anyway, getting back to Carl Yansky, uh, as I say, he was punished by the higher ups for going outside the system for his publicity, so they relegated him to low level projects where he really wasn't going to be able to get in any trouble. He died in 1950, age 44, from that same kidney uh, ailment. And those same people who made sure he didn't have any more breakthroughs would later say that if he'd lived longer, he would absolutely have won the Nobel Prize for his achievement. And like Dr. Van Fleet and like Russell Lowell, Carl Yansky is commemorated in a big way in New Mexico and in a pretty big way in Home Dome but not in his chosen town of Little Silver, where he lived the, for his entire of his professional career. All right, our fourth genius. For some of you, uh, people of a certain age, they have, they have no clue what you're looking at. And for people of, an, of another certain age, it's probably gonna bring back some, some memories, but what we're looking at here, of course, is a good old fashioned dark room. So you have a clock, over on the left because the timing of this processing was critical. And you have those plastic bins, which would have been used for various kinds of chemical solutions. For a hundred years, all photography, for the most part, except for obviously Edwin Land and the Polaroid photography systems, involved the use of film that had to be developed and printed. Um, and this was a time consuming process. You had to have special uh, facilities, special chemicals, special equipment, and you needed training because it was easy to screw up. You, you could make a small mistake in the processing of film and ruin an entire roll of film um, quite easily. And so what we're talking about, this next genius, her career was spent in this era, in the era of analog color photography. Her name was Marilyn Levy, and she was a genius in photochemistry, and her breakthroughs were on behalf of the Army and the Navy. All right.
brief history of military photography. These earliest photos, say uh, Matthew Brady's daguerreotypes, um, those early cameras had such slow shutter speeds that they really weren't useful uh, for taking pictures of moving objects. So most of um, what was uh, you know, used uh, in terms of photography in wartime was capturing the aftermath. And what you're looking at here, incidentally, is the aftermath of the um, Battle of uh, Bull Run in Manassas, the uh, uh, Antietam. And, uh, but that all changed with World War I. Uh, the, ad, the advent of uh, uh, air, um, aerial um, reconnaissance, starting with inflatable uh, airships like the one you see there, uh, and heavy, and then the, the heavier and air um, uh, airplanes that had just been introduced by the Wright brothers just a few years before. Um, this is happening at the same time that World War One is is, is is playing out before national audiences. Staggering, protracted stalemate of trench warfare, which critically important for the generals on both sides to be able to see what the other side's up to. And so this starts a space race of a little bit of using these various airships for aerial reconnaissance photography. So companies like Eastman Kodak stepped up. That's a Kodak camera that was developed specifically for aerial reconnaissance photography. And you see it's almost crudely bolted right onto the side of the aircraft and it's being manually operated by the photographer. And so, uh, at, you know, with every passing the month and year of, of the First World War, uh, um, th this, this became increasingly important. This clearly carried forward in World War II, where the very design of aircraft on different sides began to anticipate the importance of uh, reconnaissance, um, both ob observational, but also photography. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, different airplanes were being designed specifically, in some cases, high uh, altitude aerial reconnaissance photography or low uh, altitude. In both Korea and Vietnam, the tactical uh, tactical uh, aviation was pretty much now the realm of jets, which were um, also perfectly good um, in some cases for high altitude reconnaissance. But the low level reconnaissance that was really critical in Vietnam, they had to use planes that could fly lower and were slower. And so they were still using good old propeller planes like this that didn't even have guns on them. They weren't helpless. You can see that something on the wing there. That's that they, they, they could fit them with rockets so that if someone shot at them, they could fire something back. Um, but the point was that uh, the, they, they, uh, they used a variety of different kinds of means um, to get the different kinds of pictures they wanted. There was also something else in Vietnam that was kind of special called DASPO. And that's the Department of the Army Special Photographic Office. It was only in existence for 12 years from 1962 to 1974. But these guys were essentially like what we now know today, we, you know, journalists would be embedded with the army to capture what happens on the ground um, when the army is at war. In those days, the army had its own soldiers that they trained as photographers and sent out to the field with frontline units to capture what was going on on the ground, both for the generals, for the, the senators and congressmen and the president, but also for the general public. And that's one of the reasons why we have so many more amazing, compelling images from Vietnam than we do from Korea. And uh, you can visit the Library of Congress and, and look up, just put in DASPO and see just breathtaking of photography. And you can imagine this is pretty dangerous work. You know? um, and uh, some of these photographers did pay the ultimate price. Now, um, we're talking about developing film. And the question is, how important is it that this film gets developed fast? And it seems pretty logical that that would be helpful in a military setting. Well, we're going back to World War II real quick here. In the, when they used some of the larger aircraft for high uh, altitude aerial reconnaissance, so like a B-24 Liberator, for example, they had developed a portable darkroom. Now, that doesn't mean that it was less steps or faster, but it means they were developing the pictures right on the plane. and in some cases, uh, they were having uh, uh, photo interpreters, intelligence agents on the plane so that the, they were radioing the results of the area reconnaissance while the plane was still in flight. So that tells you that timeliness of getting that information into the right hands was considered absolutely critical. 
And here's another quote that I think sums it up more plainly. The wing commander says, your goal should be showing my pilots the film of their last mission before they fly their next one, which I think is a fairly reasonable thought. This was the entire focus of Marilyn Levy's professional career, working as a civilian employee at Fort Monmouth, the Signal Corps, comm section, the hexagon, looking for ways to accelerate the speed of photo processing, and also er error reduction. How do we make sure that if the photographer screws up the settings, we could still get usable images uh, from their work? So here's Marilyn Levy. She was born on a date unknown, and part of that is because she didn't have a middle name, and there were a lot of Marilyn Levy's in that part of Long Island and, and New York City in those days, but she was born to uh, parents Moses and Rachel Levy of Forest Hills. She had a brother named Norman Lee, not Levy, um, and she never married, so I don't know why she and her brother had different names. We don't know very much about Norman, except that he was a mechanical engineer who also worked at the Hex at Fort Monmouth. Uh, Marilyn graduated from Hunter College in 1942 with a bachelor's degree in chemistry and pursued graduate studies at the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn. Before going to work for the government in 1951 as a chemical inspector, she was a chemist for various firms in New York. She was first employed by Fort Monmouth in 1953 and at that time lived in a home at uh, McLaren Street, 100, 100 McLaren Street in Red Bank, which is just outside the historic district. And she lived there for about 20 years. She never married or had children, but she was active in the foster, things like the foster parents program, um, where she sent financial support to children in other parts of the world so they could have food and clothing and education. And she was very, very active in various kinds of community groups, especially the Monmouth chapter of the Society of Photographic Scientists and Engineers. Her, her entire career is one series of firsts and onlys for women scientists uh, working for the Army. Um, and it's just an incredible track record among the first 10 civilian employees to get the new cash incentive award, uh, honored by the Society of Scientists and Engineers with the service award for her work on rapid photographic processes. By age 40, she had nine patents. By 1963, she was presenting papers entitled Applications of Photographic Emulsion Modulation Transfer Curves. And if you know what that means, you are way ahead of me. Published, uh, published technical articles. A couple of years later, she has her 12th patent, a new record for women at Fort Monmouth. What's interesting about that is that means that somebody else had 11 patents and another woman at Fort Monmouth had 11 patents. And I want to know who that person is. I'm, I, that's Believe me, I, I'm looking forward to finding out some of the other people who were um, of this ilk. Um, recognized with a special act award for her breakthrough in wide latitude photography. This is number, you can look this up, it sounds impossible, but it basically enabled useful images to be gotten off a roll of film, even if the photographer had overexposed it by a factor of 100,000%. Pretty impressive. And she won the second highest award that the um, Army gives to civilian employees, the Meritorious Service Award in 1971, which is 1971, by that year, she had authored 15 technical articles. By 1975, her major breakthrough, she had discovered that she was working with the people from Kodak on uh, something some people, some of you might remember fondly, Kodak Ektachrome color film. And she was able to reduce the time taken, required to process Ektachrome from 53 minutes to 11. And part and parcel of that was her new process reduced the number of required sequential steps from 10 to 4. If any of you out there work for a big company that might have had a Six Sigma program or a process improvement or quality control, that kind of improvement that come, that's coming after decades and decades of essentially being at a standstill is astonishing in terms of how much of a breakthrough it is. Now, here's what she had to say about it. I began my research about two years ago to produce a more rapid processing system in conjunction with the U.S. Army aerial surveillance operations, and the public will benefit because it was supported by public funds. The reduced time consumed in processing will be a great help to the Army and the general public. Well, you know, if you remember back then, you remember that at one time there was no instant gratification for taking pictures. You had to take your little film and wind it up again and then make sure you put it into a little container, and then you had to get in the car and go someplace and pay somebody some money, hand over your little thing, wait a few days, go back and pick up the thing, and then find out all your pictures were out of focus. Um, 
at least some of her breakthroughs, again, working in conjunction with Eastman Kodak, did lead to the advent of the one-hour photo mat, which, again, meant that you could drop off your film, go buy groceries, and have your out-of-focus pictures in your hand in mere minutes. And so that really was a, a benefit to the public. Uh, the first digital camera is not coming along until the 1980s. Here she is uh, winning the Army's Research and Development Achievement Awards. Of course, the only woman. Uh, in 1975, she changed GS-15. This is the highest level of employment a civilian can have working for the Army. It means the highest pay grade, the highest benefits. Um, and of course, needless to say, at the time she got that, she was the only woman in that part of Fort Monmouth to have that uh, 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 level. And by the time she retired in 1979, she had earned 35 patents in total. And uh, she retired um, and, and stayed in Little Silver and uh, she basically started teaching herself new things. So she actually taught herself how to paint. Um, she thought that she didn't believe that that art was an innate talent. She thought it was something that could be learned and um, um, self-taught. And so that just gives you an idea of, of how her mind worked. Um, she died on June 19th, 2014, age 92. Um, she's buried in a family plot in Saddlebrook in Bergen County, but we don't have a picture of that. So that's another missing gap that we really wish we knew more about Marilyn Levy. And I am kind of hoping that because she was still around in this area not too long ago, that some people will be able to come out who have um, some memories uh, of their own. And that is that. Hi. <laughs> Hold on one second. You can hear me? Yeah. OK. Hold on. Just turning on my video. Oh, there I am. <laughs> well, that was awesome. Wow. OK, so the last thing that you said about Marilyn Levy dying in 2014, this is killing me because, you know, I would love to have done an oral history interview with her. Right. I, you know, she she was obviously very modest um, and, and, you know, there just doesn't see there's there's so so little we actually really do know about her. But because she was among she was a, a, among the living that recently. I just know that there are people out there that will um, remember her and that can help us fill in some of those gaps. Yeah, I'm already writing down <laughs> writing down notes. That's exciting. All right, cool. We'll have to get on that. Um, does anybody have any questions for John tonight? As we're waiting. Yeah, so I, I'm just amazed. I, I, I mean, they're all amazing as is in your title for amazing geniuses. Um, but, and you know, I noticed um, Joe Zemla, my colleague is from Little Silver and he did not make your list of geniuses. Well, you know, he's, he's still among the living. And mm, okay. so, is that the know, bar? It, you know, it's, it's you, know, I, you know, I wanna kind of, you know, give him his due so that when he, we pay him uh, his uh, honor that, you know, he'll have his, his complete career, all his patents, all, all his many achievements, um, which, you know, probably will, you'll have to schedule a two hour lecture um, for, for the tale of Joe when that comes around. John, I don't think, I don't think it can be done in an hour. <laughs> I would try We it. have a question. We have a question. Uh, Joanne would like to know, was the Lovett Farm part of Sickles and Parker House? Nope. Okay. Sorry, nope. There's your answer. Anybody else have a question? You know, another thing, I mean, I did, I've done some pretty intensive, um, like graduate projects on photography in Vietnam. Never heard of Marilyn Levy. You know, it's astonishing how much they pretend that the film didn't need to be developed. And so I, 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 I bought a book. There's an entire book just on the history of naval aerial reconnaissance photography. And 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 even though uh, Marilyn Levy worked for the Army Signal Corps, she was very definitely working with the Navy because they were obviously trying to they, they had to benefit from the same uh, uh, scientific breakthroughs. Um, and this book never mentioned processing at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it it gave the every type of plane that was ever used to take a picture, and incredible stories about the brave pilots and the photographers. And then, oops, I guess it just magically all happen somewhere. And the DASPO thing too, I couldn't, I, I, again, I, 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 asked, I asked a lot of people connected with that organization. I couldn't get anybody to say who uh, developed their film. 
Um, and, and, and if you people, uh, those of you who are photographer bugs from the era of 35 millimeter SLR photography, you remember we used to, we'd call it souping. It's like, you know, you take your, who, who's going to soup your film? Um, did those photographers soup their own film or were there other problems? Because they were on the front lines. What happened to that film? Where did it get developed? Who developed it? Um, was it important that it was developed fast or not? It might, the Daspo film might not have been critical, but obviously the aerial stuff was. I know during uh, World War II, they used to convert it to like microfilm before sending it back because it was lighter. Yeah. Just, um, yep. Okay. Oh, I knew, I knew we were going to hear from Gary because he's our master photographer here. He says, these inventors were covered in the Monmouth County Archives exhibit and catalog on local inventors published yes. in 2017. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now, the thing was, that, of course, um, I wanted to go a lot further than that story. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, that, that's a, that, it is a nice write-up and it's an excellent catalog that I highly recommend. Uh, but, it, you know, didn't say anything about like what she did or where she came from. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I really wanted to um, go uh, be, uh, that, that's an, it is an excellent um, catalog and write-up. Um, yeah, and, they all are. And, all and, and, and thanks for Gary mentioning that. Um, but um, the, my story on Marilyn Levy is four times as long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of the uh, Monmouth County Archives catalogs, they're fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, you definitely, you've added to the record here, which is great because that's what we're all doing, right? Is adding to Yeah, it. yeah, that's the idea is build, build expand, learn, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, continuous improvement. And I love that for the timeline, you have, um, I just like the people that you choose to contribute to it because you're picking some really top quality people. You've got Rick Gefkin, you've got Melissa Ziobro, you have Randy Gabrielle and like, that's important. The sources that you're um, tapping, it just lends credibility to, you know, to the material that you have, which is really good. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to, um, to have that kind of interest in participating from people of that level of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any questions for John? Which I think means that you have really like fleshed everything out. You've answered everybody's questions. Look at what a good job you did. <laughs> and I'm on time. Yes, that's very good. Somebody's <laughs> raising their hand, but hold on. Oh, I'm just saying thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John. This was really, um, really awesome. And uh, it makes me want to look Don't into forget. them more, you know, what? Forget June 24th, Little Silver Centennial. Come Happy on down and, and, and enjoy a little celebration of, of what makes small town America great. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And uh, guys, don't forget about our uh, big celebration on Sunday at 70 Court Street in Freehold. Uh, MCHA is opening up its new exhibit and we're so excited to, uh, to show it to you. So I hope you all come out. We're open from 12 to 5. You can check the website. And uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Night.